Hey, Freedom Fighters. This is David Delaney with 10 Bound. Thank you so much for listening to the Sales Development Podcast and tuning in each week. You are amazing. Sales development is the hardest job on the go-to-market team, and you do it well every day, and we appreciate you being here. Hey, I wanted to really quickly let you know about a project that we've been working on over the last couple months that we launched a beta version over at 10bound.com forward slash directory. And what this is, is a directory to help you out as you're looking for products and services that support your sales development efforts. As you may know, we have developed the first sales development industry market map where we pull together the very, very specialized products and services that are created to help you hit your sales development goals. And the number one uh, request that we got after we developed the market map is, hey, how do I double click on this and learn more about the companies, products and services that are on the market map here on Tambound? And we didn't have anything like that. You could just basically download the market map and kind of use it as a guide to start looking at some of these other companies that you may need for your sales development strategy. So we developed the directory And what it is, is basically you look at the market map, you look at the quadrant that you're interested in. So say you're shopping for outsourced SDR services, or you're looking at all the different availabilities around sales engagement platforms that are there. Now you can actually double click on that, go to the directory, and each one of the companies will have their own page, a showcase page where they can put down very quickly, okay, What's the difference between them and the other ones? What's their value prop? What are their case studies? And how do I get in touch with them? You know, boom, boom, boom. An easy way for you to, to check whether they're legit. This is a beta version. So we're going to be developing more robust capabilities so that you can save companies, look at their various ratings on rating sites, and have that all in one place as you're doing your sales development research. So we're really excited about that. If you are a company that sells to the sales development community, be sure to claim your profile, get on there, register, get your page up, get your value prop up, get a few differentiators so that people know about you and they don't have to go to, you know, a bunch of different sites. They can just start to gather that information in one place and be sure to leave a comment. Let us know what you think. Let us know what it's missing, what would help you to be able to determine your sales development strategy and companies that you use that aren't on the market map and are not in the directory, but should be that have really helped you to achieve your sales development goals. So again, it's 10bound.com forward slash directory. Get on there, check it out. Let us know what you think. Thanks. Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to another edition of the sales development podcast. I have a guest on the show that I am very, very honored to have on Mr. Dave Holly, independent SaaS marketing startup consultant uh, and a good friend of mine, very wise individual. I think you're going to love getting to know him a little bit. Dave, how you doing? Good. Hey, thanks, Dave. I appreciate it. Very kind words. Man, I've learned so much from you, Dave, and I just can't wait to share this with the, the group here in the sales development world. You know, you're working with some of the highest growth companies out there right now and, and helping them get on point with their marketing. You know, if folks have not met you yet, how did you get into the marketing expertise, you know, field and what, what's your background in working with these companies? Yeah, sure. And thanks for having me. It's really great to get connected with your audience. So I've been doing early stage startup marketing for the better part of 20 years. Initially, I was a go to market and market research consultant for a company on the East Coast. I did that for about five years. I did a quick stint, stint at a billion dollar company. I learned that was not for me. And then moved on to become an operator in six different early stage startups, usually A, B round. I did a couple of C rounds and, and one D round. So I, I've sort of seen a lot in those early stages. As a product marketer, initially demand gen and product marketer, and then the last seven years or so, sales development as well. So sort of most of those, those marketing skill sets, digital sales development and product marketing be sort of the most prominent. And it, as with many early stage marketers, spent a little bit of time in PR and branding, but not sort of a bailiwick for me and, and usually not super important in those early, early rounds. Mostly you're focused on demand gen, development and product. So, 
in the last two years or so, I've been running my own consultancy, working with some great companies in these early rounds and helping them to, I guess an easy way to think about it, helping them to avoid the landmines that I've stepped in and learned from uh, in my career. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and there's some specific types of companies. I mean, first of all, people, if you're out there and you can actually get Dave to come in, I know I'm, I'm really hyping you up, man, but I know, I know Dave really well. If you can actually get Dave to come in and help you out, it, this is an amazing opportunity that you're doing consulting now instead of being locked up at a company. But there's specific types of companies that you have found a niche in in helping. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. The easy way to think about it is if you're raising around and you think you can improve your marketing, then that's an easy way to think about where, where I might step in. Most of the work that I do, I mean, starts with questions like, how do I get my first 20 customers so I can raise my A round? More often what I hear is I invested in a marketer or marketing agency or programs that didn't work out usually for a very common set of reasons, which I can get into if you'd like. But I guess most, most apparently, we, I find that folks tend to hire a, a junior level marketer and give them a head of title. And the hit rate on that is 50-50 from what I can see. And the other end of the spectrum is folks tend to hire a more senior marketer, but usually a corporate marketer, which for those of you out there and, and folks who read Jason Lemkin know that, that, sca- that, that the skill difference is very, very different. And, and, and they have difficulty moving into the early stage and the demands in the same way that an early stage demand marketer would probably have difficulty in corporate marketing. So usually one of those hires has happened, but maybe not usually, but half the time one of those mistakes has happened before I get a call. But the other half of the time, I counsel people away from those mistakes and help them to get the, the initial marketing set up beyond the one or two programs that are working for them. Right. And this is very, this is very hands-on, getting those first customers, getting the, the messaging on point, like getting the system set up. And where you come in, you know, you see sometimes they've hired some people, a junior level person or someone more senior, and, and they've made some mistakes there. There's a lot to figure out. What are some of those common reasons that you see, you know, people trying to do this and it just goes sideways? It doesn't work out. Like what, what do you see out there? Yeah, there's usually, so there's three buckets that I handle and I see a lot and others I pass on the, you know, folks that I know, but the three buckets for me are one product marketing leads with the product. That's one of the three main mistakes I, I see. It's very difficult to sell a product to someone who doesn't know why they want to buy the product. And when you lean into your product and your features, like on your homepage and the first you know, things you say, without talking about things like why this is super important, what kind of return you're going to get, why it's inevitable is a big storyline I'm, I'm using right now. And just go right into your features, it's very difficult to translate those features into benefits. And it really puts the bone, the, the onus on your prospect to figure that out. And I think a lot of early stage companies feel like they spend so much time on the product and it's great. They just feel like these things should be fairly obvious or they have trouble moving from product focus to customer focus. So what I challenge my clients to do and I work with them on is getting yourself really into those customer shoes, using their language, understanding how the product will impact and why it's inevitable that they'll buy something like your product and really just getting them in a position where they can lead with that message rather than, you know, kind of here's my shiny new feature. It tends to work a lot better. And I have a market research-based practice where I do double-blind surveys for folks to help them to understand what is the message that's going to get buyers to buy this year. And typically that's a big part of it, telling the story about how other people or how that these customers will achieve great success with the product. So that, that's a big number one. Number two tends to be demand generation because somebody else did it. I see this all the time. CEOs get input from and head to market and get input from VCs and others and sort of say, well, I have you know two other investments who are making a bunch of money using search engine marketing. I see this one a lot. So I went and invested a bunch of money in search engine marketing. But these are often, as you know, early stage startups are missionary environments. People you know, don't know your product exists. And my question is always like, why would you invest in, a, you know, people can't search for something they don't know exists, you know? And that's probably the most egregious example. But it's about alignment of demand generation programs with early stage, right? In the early stage, you do, you, you know, I tend to recommend, in early, let me rephrase, in early stage missionary environments, so I tend to recommend that folks recognize that nobody knows 
necessarily why your product's that great. And you need a lot of content marketing to convince them why they should care and how the product's going to work and how this is going to change their business and how to buy the product and how to prepare for the implementation. All this sort of how-to content helps a lot because it builds confidence in the audience that your company and your product can make big, massive changes, right? The inverse is also true. You, you know, there are a lot of companies that, that follow a, what I call a build a better mousetrap product, right? So sort of the existing market with budget and you've built a faster, less expensive or better product, you know, search engine marketing can work great there because people are looking for stuff, right? And most of, the, most of the demand generation problems that I see don't take that into account. Some of these concepts about sort of where is the buyer and they're, and they're thinking about you and how can you create content and find the channel that best gets them on board. And there's a ton of operational stuff that has to be done at the stage, which, which really rotates around, you know, using things like salesforce.com correctly to set up your data and your lead flow so that you can talk to your CFO, most importantly, about how the investments did and, and why they did well or not well. So that's probably the big number two really around demand gen. And number three is really about sales enablement. You see this a lot where you get great brand, you get some good demand gen, and then you go talk to the sales team and the sales team is saying things like, either we don't have a deck, we don't have tools, we don't have what we need to close deals, and I'm just sort of making it up as I go. Right? That's sort of a lack of product marketing, which often is one of the last marketers hired on an early stage team. That's okay when you have three, maybe two salespeople that you really trust to be creative and, and sort of not sell outside the box. But once you start to scale that team, you know, these early sales leaders cannot be replicated, right? You're probably not going to hire, if you hire two or three great A plus salespeople, you're probably not going to, the next six hires probably aren't going to be A plus as well, you know? And so you've really got to give them a roadmap and say, sort of, here are the steps in the sales process. And, you know, innovate if you see a better way, but for now, we want you to follow this process. And, and I don't see that a lot. Usually that's like the C round where there's 20 or 30 salespeople throwing out their hands saying we need tools and help to close these deals. So it's a big three. It's, it's sort of what you say up front. Step two is usually how do you reach those people, right, in the most cost-effective way. And step three is usually enable those salespeople to increase that close rate. And that's one of the tougher issues you see at the early rate, uh, the early rounds. Got it. So, so get ahead of these things first. So what happens, you know, you come in and, and you have this, this philosophy and you've seen this, you've made mistakes over the course of your career and you've seen things go off the rails and, and, you know, put this into place. What do you see happening when you come in to, to do the consulting initially? Like say they, they hired that junior level head of, you know, marketing type of person. And is none, of, are there pieces of this that's in place or is it just, this is a completely new concept to people? No, I don't think it's completely new. You know, I, I think 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, it was completely new. And that's where a lot of folks made the wrong hires. And frankly, the skill sets for early stage startup marketing were rare because there weren't that many folks who had done it that long. I got very lucky and that was started on it 14 years ago and I worked for a marketer who really understood all this stuff. So, you know, in their defense, a lot of these mistakes, they certainly back in the day, there, there, there really wasn't that much to talent to pull from. Today, there's a ton of talent. And what VCs have realized I, in terms of unit economics is that it takes a special kind of marketer to really just focus on revenue. And, you know, that's been a buzzword for five years now or so, marketers focused on revenue. But at the end of the day, you know, there's, there's often this dichotomy between marketing and sales in particular, where marketing feels like, oh, I delivered the leads. And, you know, and sales says, oh, the leads are terrible, right? Everybody knows this story, at least on this podcast. What I think is happening now is that marketers are getting moved into compensation and sort of reviews based on opportunity generation which is a much better way to go, in my opinion, than, than just sort of lead. A lot of people have moved in this direction as well. So that's a good move. But what tends to happen is the marketers may or may not have bought into that concept. You know, the more senior they do, usually because they have stock in the company, so the more junior may maybe have come out of situations where this is very different for them to say, well, I'm responsible for creating pipelines. Some of this is out of my control. Absolutely true. Having said that, organizations are moving away from the, you know, let's get a marketer who's, or just our first marketer should, should be super creative and create great campaigns to hey, let's find this demand gen person who can fill the pipeline. And I've seen that a lot. And so if you're listening in and your marketer hasn't been moved to pipeline, it'll happen. 
it's going to, it's coming in their direction for sure. It's, it's the majority of the folks I talk to now. It's very different than 10 years ago. But, you know, directly answer your question, I mean, I think what I walk into is folks that have, you know, kind of put it simply, the CFO looks at me and says, you know, we invested X in marketing and we didn't get that much out of it, or the CEO. And I ask them what that means, and they say things like, well, we got somebody who runs a lot of great events and great gets good people to come to the events, but we don't close any deals out of it. You know, and I say, well, what are other kind of programs are you running? And they say just events, you know, or maybe they have a, one SCR. And that's where, in, that's where the real problem is. It's not necessarily that the problem that they got one event or one series of events wrong. It's that marketing has to be a portfolio play, in my opinion, to reduce your risk, right? And, you know, financiers will tell you, and you have 401k, you've been told this, right? Don't put all your money in international stocks or Bitcoin, right? Like have some stuff in bonds or depending on your age. <laughs> Absolutely the same concept in marketing. You want to, I usually I recommend a minimum of three, but usually ideally five, depending on your budget, test campaigns. There can be events in there. Maybe there's some SEM, maybe there's an investment in SEO, maybe there's content distribution, right? Like there's a, a, I mean, there's dozens of types of marketing campaigns you can run. What companies need to do is recognize that no one can predict the future. And the earlier stage you are, the less likely you are to be right about your marketing campaign. And you should run a portfolio of them. And you can do small spends for tests. You know, this is just basic lean marketing principles, but you know, take 10% of your budget and test each channel before you put the other 90% in and have a couple of tests going at the same time. The likelihood that you will meet your goals with this portfolio-based approach, it's much higher than placing a single bet and kind of seeing how it goes. And that, that's what I do see a lot, is, is folks think that there's sort of one marketing program that's going to be the panacea and solve all their pipeline problems. That's probably the biggest misconception I see. Yeah. Got it. Okay. And you're asking for a little bit of rope, you know, to hang yourself in so, to some extent, because because this is a little bit of a longer game, right? Because it seems like if someone comes in and they say, I have my playbook, you know, I have all the answers. We're going to run events. We're going to do this because this is what we did over at Marketo and Salesforce, you know, five years ago. And that confidence, then the CEO can probably say, oh, okay, this guy's or this guy or gal is is on it and I don't have to worry about it. And then six months later, it goes off the rails. What you're coming in and saying, this is a little bit more of a long game. I mean, right now we're leading with the product. So we got to reverse that, find out about the market. We've got to set up a educational campaign to get people to understand it. And then we have to train the salespeople and enable them. And that's a longer game than most startup founders probably want to play, it seems. Yeah. Yeah. And so it makes it easy for me to pick my clients, right? There you go. Yeah. (laughs) And, and, you know, and and again, not so not to be flip about it, but like, that's what marketing is, right? Like if you want to fill the pipeline, and and I've told, you know, folks I haven't worked with this, if you're looking to fill the pipeline in three months with a whiz bang campaign, you're taking a huge risk. Because that whiz bang campaign that you're excited about or the, the junior marketer who's done two campaigns, campaigns, types of campaigns in the past, and now they're going to try those same campaigns, you know, the likelihood that it works is low, right? And so, you know, the more, I guess the second time CEOs and the CFOs, and sometimes I had a product that I talked to, they get this concept because they're all, you know, they have the more patience and they've been through, they've seen this before. And it's the first time CEOs that really want that whiz bang, make it happen, like immediately. And I walked them through the process and I don't know, I've tried this before, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, I, I was of the same point of view that we can go create an awesome campaign and it'll work, but the risk profile is much too high. And the thing about this is this is a huge amount of money, right? Like after real estate and then people, most startups, the third biggest cost is marketing spend. You really don't want to place such a big bet on one campaign you know, it's like a 10% chance. I'll say in my experience, it's going to work out. When you do the portfolio, you're probably, you, you know, you get more like 75% likelihood of success, right? And so when I explain to that people, I, I think people get it. I think they're a little surprised that a marketer talks about it that way. I do get that a lot, but that's just the way, you know, my experience has worked. And that's what I've, I've learned over the years from, you know, from bosses and mentors and things like that, that you really want to spread out your bets because you don't really know in the early stage. So if you're wrong, you know, when you're raising your C and B round, you have to go to the VCs and say, these are the channels that really work. They're predictable, they're scalable and repeatable. But until you get a lot of proof 
of that, and we could talk about a lot of proof means, but enough proof, you really shouldn't be placing that big bet on even like two campaigns. You, you need to spread it around and there are ways to spend less money in a, in a much lower risk kind of way and then scale it as signs of predictability show up because when you have predictability, then you can scale. And I just, early stage marketers, they just don't know and they have to go and figure out where that stuff is. And it's, you know, it is unique every single time I talk to a client, that's for sure. And say say one of the CEOs is listening to this and they, they're looking at it and going, gosh, okay, we're running some some Google ads and we're hosting events, but then we've got an SDR, but it's just kind of like falling flat. I mean, we're not we're not doing much here. Like what are two or three things do you think other than for talking to you, obviously, and listening to this. Yeah, sure. Where should they start to, to think about it? Should they think like, do I have the right person doing this? Or, you know, what, where, where do they even start? Yeah, it's such a great question. Where do you even start with that? So I'd say a couple of things. Don't like assume the person is good, right? You hired them, right? So you have a level of trust, right? Just start, start with that process. Start with what are hap- what's happening in the campaign? And a lot of companies, they don't do this at the early stage. This is simply not enough time, but you know, make sure the data is structured in a way that you can definitively say, like we were looking for 2% conversion with a 10% close rate in 180 days, right? Like, which all sounds not great, but that's what you see a lot in the early stage. Okay, did we achieve that or not objectively on these two or three campaigns? We did or we didn't. Then go to your person and say, why? Why did we achieve or, or underachieve on these campaigns? If you get an answer that's logical and they have next steps, like e.g. that one was terrible, we're never doing that one again. This one was good, but it needed these three tweaks. And that one was great. I want to pour more money into it and let the person go and do that. If they don't have those kind of insights and answers and they talk and start diving into sort of the technicalities of SEO or going deeper into things like their click-through rate, that person either doesn't have the the management ability to communicate with an executive, which is a very solvable problem, or they don't really know what they're doing, right? And like, that's when you can kind of figure out, okay, it's the person. So that's the difference, right? Like the person running the process should be thinking about it, or at least should be able to communicate it and think, spend some time thinking about what the CFO and the CEO want to hear. Now, again, often if that's a junior marketer, that's just some sort of management, upward management training where they just need to know specifically what the quote unquote the bosses want to see. But if they can't get there, then that's a problem with your early stage because you're going to get mired in bad data and programs that didn't work with no good explanation. And I do see that quite a bit. So that's how I think about assume the person's good because you hired them and then test it, you know, test, you know verify it. Assume positive intent. And then yeah. it's also on the leader, the CEO, you know, or the CFO to start with that goal and lay it out clearly. And then if we didn't hit the goal to ask why, I mean, that, that, that's, that's on you, Mr. S- Mr. And Mrs. CEO, right? It totally is. But I'll just, I'll double click on that. It's so rare that I see a CEO or CFO who under not understands this, they get it, but this sets goals around pipeline or lead number and cost. I, I end up spending a lot of time with management, showing them why this model is important and then training folks, you know, mid-level and junior folks. So I agree with you in theory, but what I would say is the onus is, and the reality is the onus is actually on the marketer to go to the CFO and say, we can afford this cost and then we need this many leads and this time frame to create this much pipeline. Therefore, I need X amount of resources. And it's just, you know, that logic of the conversation, I just don't see that much. And, and it's to some degree, the marketer is waiting for the CFO to, to do it. If it was too busy and or, you know, thinks about it maybe slightly differently or uses different words and different language, but they're kind of saying the same thing. I see that a lot. So you, if you're a marketer out there and you're thinking about revenue, go write up a model. I'll be writing some blogs on this that I'll share at some point. That basically says, you know, it should be pretty simple, right? Two conversion rates, MQL to SQL and SQL to close. Those are your variables. Everything else is just math. And, and your CFO will should give you a hug for it. Right. He okay. or, yeah, he, he or she doesn't have time for it and may not be able to translate it as clearly as you can. So the marketer needs to step up. We'll read those blogs. And then the other thing that I that, that struck out uh, stuck out at me is when I, I work with junior level, their sales development leaders, but it's the same with marketing leaders. I see that that difficulty in communicating with executives. And 
it is exactly what you describe getting bogged down in details where it's either it's a it's a smoke screen because they really don't know or or they're focused on different things and you can tell the senior executive is just like this isn't helping me at all you know it looks bad yeah and in often cases this is just a lack of executive communication right like right. executives have to think in spreadsheets to some degree so you can at least meet them halfway by talking about the numbers right like you know, I've set up several of these. Days. I'm sure you have, as an operator anyway. I don't do this as a consultant, but you know, setting up operating models for sales development is, is you know, it, it's not a well-known science, but it's not difficult. And really, you know, even if you don't have this as an SDR, you have a compensation plan, right? Like you know that you probably know that really well. You probably you know know how to game it a little bit too, right? And what I would say is if you're listening to this and you're not sure how to communicate it, and so you just go to your CFO and their CEO and say, hey, I booked a call with Walmart, right? Like, that's cool. And you should do that. But I would also recommend you look at what kind of pipeline you're building. Is that enough pipeline? And we can talk about that. There's some fallacies around that, too. But is that enough pipeline? You know, and as you always know, right, like, am I overachieving or underachieving on the pipeline? Communicating, hey, I'm at 60% of my pipeline and it's only March, CF, you know, CFOs and CEOs will get that, right? And that's just as important as I said, a meeting with Walmart, in my opinion, because it goes to your longevity and your ability to impact the business, which is really what they're asking. Right. It's definitely an art and a science in sales development. So, and a lot of people skip over the science part and, you know, I would challenge everybody to listen to this. Do you have that operating model laid out on a spreadsheet so that you can reverse engineer your goal and know all of your conversion rates so that you can have that conversation with an executive? Because that's, you know, and, and I'm, I'm like, I'm just painting a really broad picture. But to your point, Dave, executives think in, in spreadsheets and charts and graphs and numbers. And the further up you go on the food chain, you got to have that on your, you know, fingertips or else you really can't communicate effectively, it seems. Yeah, agreed. And, and the other thing I see a lot is people say, well, I hit 110% of my quota this quarter. That's good. But if you're in an early stage company, you know, whether or not, you know, the other eight SDRs did as well is on, you know, the executive's mind. So while it may bode well for you that you hit 20, 120, 125% of your goal, what that doesn't communicate is how is that impacting the business? Like it sounds good, but I don't know is the common answer for these executives. So, you know, I mean, try to change it to money. You know, I'm at 125% of goal, but more importantly, my close rate is 30% where the average for the company is 10%. I've seen this one overlooked a lot. I had an SER on the team of mine years ago and, and she was great but she was only hitting like 80% of quota. And I was like, I'm listening to her calls, I'm working with her, I'm like, this, she's good. Like, I don't understand why, why this is happening. Well, it turned out that she had a 2X close rate. When I went and looked at the data, her opportunities closed at twice the rate of everybody else's. And I said, oh, she's, you know, she's a sniper, is what we used to call her, right? Like not a, she doesn't have, a, she doesn't have an assault rifle, she's got a sniper rifle. And she's really good at picking those people out and getting them on the call. And she knows they're super qualified and interested before that happened. Well, I mean, I had to go and, and figure out a way to make it, you know, it, 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 to change the comm model because I wanted to keep her around and I wanted her to make her money. And in fact, that at some point that was due for raise. So I do see a lot of SDR leaders that they'll skip this bullet point. And I was confused about it with this particular person, but, you know, for a couple of years. And yeah, there's another SDR leader who, who basically said, well, go look at their close rates. And, and it was a big you know, light for me. And so I think your, your, your executives will understand that too, that when you say, you know, my close rates are higher, what they what they know is you're qualifying better. And hopefully they'll ask you, why do you think that's happening? You know, that's a great conversation to have with an executive. Yeah. You, you have to look at it from a business perspective, not necessarily yep. like an example that I, I think of is you could, you could be the manager of the SDR team and say, Hey, we made 125% of quota. And the next day they say, we're shutting down the SDR program and outsourcing everything. And yep. it's like, you know, you're blindsided, but what you didn't know is exactly what you're saying, Dave, that if you double click on that, yes, you made 125% of quota, but only 36% of your pipeline converted, you know, or something yep. like that. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, totally. And the, and that's why you want that meta view a little bit. I mean, that's obviously worst case scenario. Everybody gets, you know, like, oh, but yeah. and it does happen. But I think you sort of like more commonly, and I see this one a lot, and, and hopefully I can explain it, but like I talk to sales folks about their demand generation and they say things like, I saw an email last week from sales development celebrating that they met their quota. And I've had, and this is a quote, I've had two calls set up by them this quarter. Now that's not the SDR's fault, right? Like the SDRs did what the company told them to do, but somebody has not aligned sales development to the sales quota. And I would be asking that question. You know, often in enterprise software companies where I spend most of the time, the, the bag for salespeople is 1.2 million. I got to sell 1.2 million to hit their number, right? And so getting into, well, how much pipeline? Let's say, let's just make simple numbers. Let's say it's a million dollars, right? If my sales partner needs a million dollars to close this year. And my sales partner closes at a 30% rate, which would be amazing, but just for simple, at least at the early stage. So but simple math, okay, we'll just divide it. Well, if they need a million dollars, and they close at a 30% rate, that means I as an SDR have to create $3 million in pipeline. Very simple math. You can just plug in whatever numbers you want. And what that will do is that will not only empower you to know exactly what you need to be successful, you can share it with your peers, you can look at the whole team like this, share it with the you know, SDR leaders who haven't done this. I highly recommend that you do this. And, and I'll just go on another fallacy I hear a lot. People always ask, Dave, what's the right ratio? Is it two to one? Is it one to two, three to one? Like what's the SDR AE ratio supposed to be? And the math I just explained tells you what that ratio is, right? Because if you have, you know, let's say you need $3 million of pipeline. We use a previous example. Well, if each SDR only creates 1 million in pipeline annually, then you need three SDRs to feed that salesperson. You don't see that a lot. The, but what you do see is people trying to guess three to one or two to one or whatever. Don't guess, just do the math, right? Like it's how much pipeline do you need, which is a function of your close rate. And there you go. Now, you know, sort of say it's 10 salespeople or one salespeople doesn't, person doesn't matter. The math is pretty simple. Just, just take the guideline. Again, if you need, if your salesperson needs 1 million to close and they close the 30% rate, that means they need 3 million in pipe plug in your own numbers or just simple division and you'll know exactly what the ratio should be or as an SDR, how well you are set up setting up your sales partner for success. Got it. It's amazing that you hear it's the wrong question or it's, it's, it's a surface level question. What should the ratio be? It's actually, you got to dig in more and run those numbers and then you can answer that question. You know, yep. people always yep. lead with that. And I, there's two things that I thought of. One is, what if you're what if you're sitting there and you're the SDR leader and you know you you know that the goals are not necessarily aligned but somebody gave you the goal so like you've heard that obviously you go out for drinks and stuff with the salespeople and they're like why are you guys celebrating when you only sent me two appointments the whole quarter like what should that sales development manager do if they know that things are misaligned and they're you know going in the wrong direction yeah, I mean, they should do what they were hired to do, which is solve problems. Okay. You know? Yeah, like that. And I, I, I know it's hard, you know? I'm yeah. a, I'm a Patriots fan, so I like the Bill Belichick do your job, right? Like that's, you know, it, to me, that don't get me right. wrong. Yeah. There's, also, there's always some politics and some people who like new ideas and some people who don't. So that does, I'm not saying it's easy, but you're asking what you should do. You, sh- you should raise the flag. You should work with whoever the right people are to, to make sure they understand this. And if the change doesn't happen, then yeah, I mean, you might be running into the situation you brought up earlier, David, which is, you know, we all hit our goals, but we all got let go because the things weren't aligned correctly. So maybe you should be looking around. Yeah. That's what I'd say. Yeah, yeah. Look at, look at it that way. I mean, and then the other thing I wanted to ask you is, you know, should salespeople rely on SDRs to create appointments and pipeline? And the reason I ask is there's this, I'm not going to name his name, but there's this curmudgeonly gentleman who posts on LinkedIn all the time and his whole shtick, he's a sales thought leader who writes a lot of books and stuff. I'm not going to name his name, but his whole shtick is that, you know, salespeople have punted on prospecting and we've raised like this nation of wimps who (laughs) is afraid of prospecting. And, you know, on one hand, it's like he kind of has a point because if you've got SDRs, then 
and maybe I hear it a lot, but salespeople are constantly complaining about the SDRs because they're not producing enough stuff. And I kind of want to go, you know, in the old days, like we had to do it and SDRs are almost like an additive. But on the other hand, a lot of SDR organizations, as you've mentioned, are not fully aligned. They're not firing on all cylinders. So maybe the salespeople have a point. Any thoughts on that yeah. mess? <laughs> yeah, for sure. I see this one a lot. So I, so I agree with the curmudgeonly gentleman, at least in, for step number one, which is salespeople have punted. Uh-huh. And I don't necessarily think that's a good, bad thing, though. Think about it. So you have two people who can effectively cold call instead of qualified appointments. One of them costs two hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand dollars a year. The other one costs eighty to one hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year. Which one would you hire? Right. That obviously. Yep. You yeah. Yeah. Hire the SDR. So that's why it's not because it just makes economic sense. I, I you know, and it's just the front end of the process, right? It's identify the right people politely make your case to them persistently over the course of 30 to 90 days, get them on a call, talk to them for, or email with them for three minutes to show them why the product is going to get them promoted or make a huge change in the business or get rid of that problem, right? You can train people like the people listening to, to, you know, your podcast know this, you can train people on the front end. So, you know, and, and high performing sales development teams don't fill the whole pipeline. The highest performing teams I've ever seen fill 75% of the pipeline. And that takes some time to get to. It doesn't have to take a year. It may take three to six months if you're not close, you know. And, you know, at the end of the day, it just makes economic sense. So, you know, I don't know about the whole, you know, nation of wimp things or whatever. But I, I think that I, I think that there's economic viability. And when there's economic viability, business isn't bad, right? Like that's why they're in business. So like that, that's how I think about it. I think that front end of the SDR process is a very replicable, repeatable process by somebody without a ton of experience, as long as they have the qualifications or are trained to get, more importantly, probably trained to have the qualifications and they have the right attitude, you know? I mean, one of the, it, I think other than the CEO, the SDRs have the hardest job in the startup because they have to do so many different kinds of things and they have to get the door slammed on their face 97% of the time. That's a very difficult job. It's great training for sales, but I think if, if those individual SDRs can continue, and I mean, look, Silicon Valley in a lot of ways has proved this out. I was on a, in a company 15 years ago that started this model and I had never heard of it before and many people had, so I was very lucky to get started early that in that process. But what I've seen is the quality of the SDR is a direct sort of impact on that number. And it, and it, it fluctuates in the early stages. So the debate goes from well, let's hire SDRs. Well, SDRs aren't doing a good enough job. So let's put a quota back on the salespeople. Well, the salespeople, you know, I mean, they got a three month cycle, right? And for the first six weeks, you might get some prospecting out of your salespeople, but not the last six weeks, because all they want to do is close that deal, you know? And so, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of variabilities here, but the, the net net is this model is not going anywhere. And it, at this point, it, for the folks that are sort of saying, well, I, you know, this is a bad idea. I, I can't, you know, the, ev- the evidence is pretty clear. It's a good idea. And that change is coming to your organization if, 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 if it hasn't already from a sales perspective. And again, it's a good thing, not only for the company, but I guess from a salesperson's perspective, you're essentially outsourcing the first couple of steps in sales to a young individual, partner with them and teach them what you know, and, you know, let them influence your process as well. Cause the, you know, you, you have the good ones and they really do a good job improving the overall process and getting, you know, really influencing the salespeople ultimately and how they think about the process. So it's a partnership and treat it that way. And if you're against it, I'd recommend you call, anybody who's worked in SDR, you probably get positive and negative results depending on the team. But at the end of the day, this has been a trend for the past 15 years. I, I don't think it's going away. I think it's only going to get bigger. Yeah, and let me ask you, I mean, and, and it's going off the, off the usual, you know, thought, thought pattern. If the SDR is, you know, and I, I agree, it's, it is definitely one of the hardest jobs out there. You know, could you work the math to a point where, you could elevate the SDR and make it a higher paid position with more benefits and things like that to try to 
get somebody to like stay in the position and regularly produce at a high level and not necessarily do it for a short time at a lower pay grade and then move on, like have somebody who almost is like a lifer. Do you think that that would make economic sense if you could do that? Because it seems like it's a hard job. And maybe if we you know, gave them more training, more prestige, more money, and had higher expectations that they could pay for themselves to some extent. Oh, yeah. And, and that's our, you know, I, you know, I've done that. And peers of mine have done that. Like, all okay. of those things can happen. Yeah, I want all of those things should happen. The, o- the only, like, barrier, not barrier is the wrong word, but the only sort of limitation to that is market rate. You know, and don't get me wrong. I've talked with SDRs and leaders who have consistently paid above market rate, usually about 20% or so, and they do great things like career tracking. And sort of the best thing you can do to empower them is put, if you're paying your SDRs on calls, you're paying them on opportunities. If you want to empower them and then give them a kicker, you know, some fixed set amount when it closes or 1% or half, half a point on the deal. I've seen these kind of, and I've implemented these kind of strategies and they work. When the SDR knows they're on the hook for opportunities, not calls, for example, it, it can be more difficult. It's a more difficult job. But when they know they're going to get paid more and they're okay with it, then they go and do the job and they find it a lot more rewarding. Like I set up a call, I qualified them, I got them, you know, I got everything done I needed at my AE, let me listen in. You know, these are like basic first steps in moving in the direction you just sort of outlined in. But, you know, when they do that, the best SDRs stand up and go, I, I enjoy my job a lot more and I'm making more money, you know. And if you career track, the AE is going to come a lot more appreciative of that person and then they're going to be sharing a lot more and they got a bit of a mentor there as well. So it's really good for culture. And so, yeah, I would say all, do all, if your SDR program is getting predictable, E.g., you have a handful of them and they're hitting quota and the, the, the quota is converting at a, re, at a predictable rate, you're ready to at least consider this stuff because the SDR arm of any demand generation or marketing or whatever operation, right, go to market, is quickly becoming sort of a very standard and required, at least an enterprise a required step. And that's usually mid-market and enterprise software, I guess I should say. It's required in a lot of places. And if you don't have it, you should have a really good reason for your VC. Why not? Because they're going to ask you that question. That is so interesting. Okay. You heard it here first, folks. Dave Hawley. I want to ask you, I got one other quick question. Going back to the, the whole marketing framework that you put together is I heard the term product-led marketing like a couple of years ago, where I'm, you know, I'm sure that everyone's familiar with that. It's it's the Atlassian, the Slack, the GitHub, you know, where people sign up for the product and and then it eventually becomes a sale. And 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 like the promise there was that it would be frictionless. It's data driven. You don't have to involve salespeople. Hopefully, <laughs> I mean that's what they would say. Yeah. And and yeah. so. What happened? Is that still a thing in your world that you see? And and then how how do like we play into that in the sales community? Yeah, I mean, so yeah, it's definitely a thing, and 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 those companies have done very well. And it's not so much a thing in, in sort of my world directly because I don't, you know, these folks don't call marketing, right? Like they figure something out. Okay. The problem, so Atlassian, Slack, and GitHub are all very good examples of organizations that built a product that was a very appealing initially to developers. And developers hate being marketed to. I've actually never done it. I've been, <laughs> I've been very, I've avoided those jobs on purpose because they, they just don't like it. But what, what developers do like is a product that is clean, elegant, and helps them sol- solve hard problems or take something off their plate that feels administrative. All of these products do that, except for GitHub, which is awesome because you can go get the code, right? And, they, and it's sort of like getting a piece of product for you, right? A lot of other benefits to GitHub. But those products can be product-led as long as they are the killer product. And they all have turned out to be. And the problem is that, and, and I'm trying to say this gently, Every product leader has invested a lot of time and money and effort and tears and joy into their product. So by default, it's their baby. So they believe it's the best product. 
it's just not often it's, it's not often true or true enough for most companies to pull this kind of stuff off. So if you believe you have the next Atlassian, Slack, and GitHub, go for it. But like, go gentle, right? Because <laughs> the likelihood that you don't is very high, right? Like, you know, point zero 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 one percent of startups become Slack, right? Like, it's right. actually, I think it, the data I saw a couple of years ago was like less than, I think it's less than seven percent of startups ever hit ten million in ARR from Pacific Crest. So it should give you a likelihood that the startup is gonna, you know flip into a lot of money, right? Like it's pretty low. Never mind Altassian or Atlassian or Slack money. So from a sales perspective, right. what I think the way the sales folks slip into this is eventually there needs to be a senior person who wants to roll it out across the company. You know? And and and, and or somewhere between it's a credit card swipe and anybody can buy it and the CFO just signed a two million dollar contract, there needs to be a salesperson in there. Right? Like it's just not going to work at that level of spend. And I think that's generally well accepted. And so I think if you're a sales person in these environments, you know, look for where the big money is. You know, I heard a great story about Dropbox from a friend of mine years ago. He was in there very early and he was young. He's an SDR. And I don't know if you know the flywheel model or not, but Dropbox sort of made this bit work very well where they would just target lots of like people with a job in a company they wanted to sell to target. Walmart, Honda, or whatever, you know, pick your big company. And so they, the marketing would go out and get a bunch of people with an at Honda address to try Dropbox, right? And then eventually there'd be enough that one of two things would happen. An outbound SDR would look at the uptick because they would provide these to the SDRs. Here's all the licenses at these companies. There's a roll up called the ones at the top, right? The biggest ones. And it, they, the smart SDR would get the CFO on the line and say, you're spending like half a million dollars with us for like, I don't know, 200 licenses. I'm just making that number up, but like a small amount of licenses. Let's get you in a million dollar deal that'll cover your whole company, right? Oh or the God. inverse would be true. The CFO would call in and go, my director of finance just told us we're spending like 200 grand with your company. I need a, I, I demand a corporate license and the SCR goes great. And the salesperson says, that's awesome. It'll cost you a million dollars. That's the flywheel model, right? So, yeah, so if you're in sales and you're product-led environments, man, go big, you know, and if that flywheel's working, you know, if not, you know, there's lots of companies out there that have a strong need for a strong enterprise salesperson and leader. You know, they're all over the valley and in San Francisco and now starting to show up around different parts of the country as well. So yeah. there's lots of opportunities. Yeah. I mean, and it's it's like it really boggles your mind what you can do with something like this because it product product led basically it's like it, it's like Dropbox is a good example, right? Anybody can sign up for the basic version, so you you're you're hoping to get thousands or millions of people using the product, and then from there the data comes in and you can start to pipe that into the SDRs and the marketing and the growth and all that stuff. And so I guess what you're saying is from the research that you saw, only 7% of companies get to the point where they're at, you know, 10 million. And so, and so the risk with product led then is you, you release this, you put all this money into the product, you release it and it just falls flat. Is that, is that fair to say? It happens. You know, it's the same philosophy that I take with marketing portfolio approach. So if you're CEO and you're saying, I'm going to bet all my money on engineering, and you're in the early stage, you should, because you don't have a product to sell, right? Like you need a couple of executives who do sales and everything else and like an engineering team. Okay, let's say now you have that. You have an MVP or some product market fit or whatever you've got, the product works. So then you're looking at your next round or your next tranche or you, you're, the money you haven't spent yet and you say, I want them to keep making the same bet. That, in my mind, would be product-led. The problem with it is it carries too much risk. It's kind of like betting on one marketing program. You, it's going to be binary. You're going to be right or wrong, like by a large margin, right? Alcalcian, right by a large margin. Other companies, wrong by one. Place your bets around. I'm going to place some bet on product. I'm going to place some bet on market awareness and, and, and or sales development. I'm going to hire the next A salesperson. I'm going to get the best CS person in here because I'm worried about churn. I, like CEOs have to think about all of those things. They t- in the early stage, they tend to lean towards engineering and product as they should to build something. In my opinion, that then clouds their judgment in later stages where they need to be taking most of their money and putting it in sales marketing because they've created pre- predictability and now they want to scale. And you see this a lot 
it just it's hard to make that shift. You know, one of the things I see quite a bit, certainly in, in the messaging work that I do, is I come to a company and they tell me the same story. And I hear this a lot, which is every 90 days we get in the room, our head of sales and our head of product debate about going to market because the head of product has a long view and the head of sales wants to close deals this quarter, which is what they're both supposed to be doing. Right. And, you know, and they debate it and debate it and every 90 days they keep it in the big deck. And then I show my clients how to end that process because I've been through that a bunch of times before. And it's all colored by what your team should and, and want to do. And it takes time for that head of product to say, okay, I get it. It's not how I would talk about the product, but it's working. And for the head of sales to say, you know what, I get that this feature is what everybody desires, but we don't have it yet. So I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not going to sell it. You know, and because both of those things happen a lot, right? So it takes some time to stop doing that. And I think it is a function of an organization that has grown out of engineering, which most of these startups have, and then not necessarily made an easy transition into placing bets on engineering and marketing and sales and CS in, in a bigger way. It's tough. I mean, they have a lot. I mean, running a company, I heard Elon Musk said running a company, it's like, eating glass and staring into the abyss. You know, it's just like... Yeah. And that's why SDRs only have the second hardest job. Right. I would agree. Yeah. You said it. Yeah. You said it. It's not quite that. I got one, one last question for you, Dave. This Dude, this is amazing. I'm getting a ton of value from this. But I wanted to ask you about the resurgence of brand. Because it seems like from what I've seen online and just, just like being out there in the community... You know, we went heavily into like lead generation, demand gen, and trying to like get all these numbers and conversion rates and everything. And then everybody brand was like this purple pens and t-shirts and stuff like that. Like everybody thought it was too artsy to talk about for a while, but it seems like it's being reintroduced into the conversation. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on brand. Yeah. Yeah, and you're, you're, you're right in that, or your observations, I guess, are right in that it is emerging. I think that it's a nomenclature thing, though. Brand does mean, you know, if you're Coca-Cola, brand means, you know, the, the font that you use and the colors, right? It does mean that, and it's important. But Coca-Cola's brand is worth more than the entire company combined by a long shot, just that with Coca-Cola, right? That's an important brand company. Right. But you're not Coca-Cola, right? You're an early stage startup, right? Your right. brand isn't, not that your brand isn't worth that much, it's that you have a mini brand, okay? So yeah, pick your colors, pick your logo, like don't hem and haw over them, just get them and let them sit for a couple of years, right? Unless you hate them. But really in early stage startup, what brand to me means is positioning. And your position needs to be defendable, it needs to be unique, and it needs to be value orientated. What I mean by that is this buyer of yours needs to see your company as something they can't really get anywhere else. It's probably not going to be something that six months from now there's you know two or three other choices from. And they have to say that thing's going to get me promoted. They don't have to say that, but I'm just you know being hyperbolic. But like that's what they're looking for, something to have a big impact, right? Because the other component of, of this brand is you've got to make your buyer look good. And when the buyer walks in and says, can't get this anywhere else, going to impact the business in a big way. And I, you know, I understand the organization and what they'll do for us. In an early stage startup, that's brand, right? It's not so much the color and the logo and Coca-Cola and the font, although people do hem and haw over it. It's more about if somebody was talking about your product, they had gone to your website. Could they articulate the answers to those questions quickly? Why is this important? Why is it why is it important now? Why is it different than other things I've done in the past? And if they can do that, then you've got a brand, right? And that's really your mini brand. Your own and yeah, maybe they remember the logo and the colors and stuff like that. But again, until you're headed towards, you know, being Coca-Cola or, you know, I mean, geez, we, we, we see companies like what Medallia went public this year. and They've got a really good brand. But I think these companies put the brand first. I think you need to do demand generation and positioning. And then, yeah, engage, you know, brand specialists, talk about the colors and logos, make sure you get something you're happy with, but make sure if you have to be 
super excited about something in marketing should be your long-term defensible position or your demand generation slash pipeline, because that's really what the VCs are after at those early stages. And then, yeah, you need to evolve into a brand organization like Salesforce has. That's a great example. They have a wonderful brand now. And they have wonderful branding, you know, and they, they had a little bit of good, they had defensible positioning up front, no software. If you remember that, right? Like the, the line crew, it's a little software guy. That's positioning. People think about that as branding. In my mind, that's positioning. And that's what early stage folks. And that brings us all the way back. I mean, that was one of your big three at the beginning when you start to conceptualize this. It's, you know, most product marketers, tech founders, you know, they lead with all the bells and whistles and the cool things that their product does. But you want to, I mean, it comes back to why is this important now? And how is this different? How is this going to get me promoted? You know, that's the feeling of the brand. And, you know, and that's what you have to identify first before you do anything else, really. Yeah, that's a great way to put it, Dave, for sure. Yeah. Well, Dave, thank you so much. I mean, again, this is just every time I talk to you, <laughs> I'm taking copious notes. I think everybody got a ton out of this. If folks want to talk to you more about this, they're trying to figure out their their mission from a marketing perspective. What's the best way to get in touch with you? Just check out my LinkedIn. I love to connect with people. My direct email address is right there. It's Dave Hawley. So H-A-W-L-E-Y. It's my, I'm like LinkedIn slash in slash Dave Hawley. So feel free to send me an invite or, or grab my email address. Should be right up, right in there in the contact info and send me a note. I'd, I'd be glad to talk to more folks. I mean, one of the nice things about doing this work is even when I don't engage with somebody as a client, you know, but I do talk to them and I do refer them to other people. I learn a lot and I get, sometimes I get these stories validated, right? There's a lot of conversations I've been having to validate the kind of the learning from sharing, but other times I get a brand new point of view. So I, I always like to, to learn folks in the early stage. So feel free to reach out. I love it. I love it, Dave. Well, thank you again. And we'll be in touch really soon to learn more about this and get you back on the show. Thanks again. Killer, thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the Sales Development Podcast, the only audio forum 100% focused and dedicated to sales development with your host, David Delaney. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on YouTube and take a moment to leave us a review on iTunes. Your support makes our show possible. If you are struggling with your sales development program, contact us at 10bound.com for a no-obligation exploratory call. Again, that's 10bound.com.